Good morning all. In this video, we'll start the discussion on the fourth module of Geotechnical Engineering 2 as per the KTU syllabus. Now the contents include the combined footing, rectangular combined footing, trapezoidal combined footing, and a few numerical problems based on that. Then you have raft foundation with the design concepts. You don't have to study the details. It includes allowable bearing capacity of raft on sand and clays. And we'll have a brief discussion on floating foundation. Then we'll move to the preliminary discussion on deep foundations, which include well foundation, the problems encountered in sinking of a well foundation, and the methods to rectify what we scope. What, what we used to call as a tilt and the shift. So these are the contents. Now, before moving into the topic specs, uh, stipulated by the university, we'll have to discuss what the shallow foundations are in practice. Now, in the previous module, we had said that shallow foundations are something which is at a depth lesser than the breadth of the footing or the foundation. So in that regard, we have various shallow foundations in practice in India, which includes the strip foundation, or strip footing, which is used to support the column loads, not the column loads, I beg your pardon, the load-bearing wall, and it's also called as a continuous footing. It looks like this. You must be familiar with this because most of our houses, which are limited to two stories, would probably have this as our foundation. So uh, when, you, when you visit a site, where the construction of a two-story building is supposed to take place, what they do is they excavate the soil to, let's say, 1.5 meter depth, and they place a layer of uh, PCC, plain cement concrete, on the level ground, then they have a footing constructor over it. And in some cases where the strong soil exists, they may probably go for the random rubble masonry, RR masonry as well. So nonetheless, these are called strip footing because they run as a strip. They will be existing everywhere below the wall of your house. So uh, that's a strip footing and it usually supports the walls. And the next one is an isolated footing. They actually support the column loads. Columns are nothing but what we call as pillar in, in, in Indian practice. So they could be probably stepped at the base or in some cases as a plain structure. It looks like this. You have the column and it's supported by an in individual isolated footing so it is not a strip it is rather a rectangular in plan or square in plan in some cases uh, for example one footing would be around let's say two meter in plan as a square shape and it would be having the load taken from a pillar or a column which is of 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter just an example so the column of 30 by 30 in dimension will transfer its load to a uh, isolated footing which is 2 meter by 2 meter in plan. I was just quoting that example just to give you a taste of the dimensions. The next one is a combined footing. Combined footing means that two or more than two pillars or columns are supported by the single footing and that of course will be a rectangular in plan usually or in some cases will be forced to give the trapezoidal plan to support the two column loads. Now they are usually used when the columns are too close together or when the property line is close to one column. So uh, when two columns are such that they are too closely spaced it would be in particular cases economical and safe to provide a single footing for the two columns combined. So that is one example where you opt for a combined footing. Another chance for you to decide on a combined footing would be these examples when, when the property line of the property that you own is very close to one of the columns that you have designed for your commercial building or house or something. So in that case you will be forced to give a combined footing where the footing will transfer the load from one pillar to the area beneath the other pillar by a slab action. That will be some that will be some example where uh, the property line has an influence on the structure, on the structures designed to be precise. So we have strip, we have isolated footing, we have combined footing, and then we have what is called as a cantilever footing. Looks like this. 
In short, there will be a strap in our system member which connects these two isolated footings which act as a beam. So this is the pillar or the column number one and this is the column number two which forms a part of the superstructure and these two pillars will be connected by a, a strap or a cantilever and then it will be resting on two individual isolated footings. So uh, uh, the beam or the strap which connects these two footings does not actually take the soil reaction. So uh, cantilever footing is used when the allowable soil pressure is relatively high and the distance between the column is large. These are the typical cases where you opt for a cantilever footing. Likewise, another example is mat or a raft foundation. They are used when there's a group of columns that a superstructure uh, houses and, and then there's another case where you go for mat or the raft foundation is when you have the allowable soil pressure being very low when you have loose pockets or when you have one part of the soil quite uh, of a low shear strength compared to the other part. So if such examples of cases exist, you'll have a better option from mat. It looks like this. So as the name suggests, it runs all over and it houses the primary and secondary beams over which you cast the columns upwards. So uh, and the advantage of uh, mat or the raft foundation is that it reduces the differential settlement, the differential settlement that we were talking about in the previous, uh, in the previous module. So uh, it's also used when the individual columns are too co close. So uh, even in that cases, you would find this to be economical. Now, the, uh, the dimensions of these mat or raft foundations could be as uh, as high as let's say uh, 10 or 15 meters in plan area and even if if the mat foundation is resting at a level let's say 10 meters below the ground level it will still be called as a shallow foundation because the depth of foundation is 10 meters and the breadth of the mat foundation is 15 meters so uh, of course df is less than b and 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 uh, and it's, it can be called as a shallow foundation. Whereas if you have an isolated footing at the depth of 10 meters, it wouldn't be called as a, as a, as a shallow foundation. You'll have to opt for a deep foundation. Uh, if, if it's 10 meter, probably in certain cases, pile foundations would be more economical depending on the case. So nonetheless, what I was trying to convey is that the dimension of the mat or the raft is so huge of the, of, of the range of greater than 15 meters, 20 meters, etc. And even more than that, depending on the load and the plan area of the building. Now, uh, the cases of choice between a cantilever footing, a strip footing, uh, and, 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 and an isolated column footing, etc., are quite clear. But the choice between the rectangular footing and the trapezoidal combined footing is quite blurred. So, uh, the choice is quite crucial. Now, if the sufficient space is available for projection, beyond each column the rectangular foundation can be chosen in, in, in which what we mean is that if you have the luxury of projecting the slab at least 20 centimeter or 30 centimeter every from the face of the column there could be an option to give a, a rectangular combined footing and if the space restriction exists on one side the rectangular footing can still be used if the column on that side is lighter which means if if you don't have the luxury of projecting the slab from this side outward, but the, the particular pillar or the column is lighter compared to this pillar, you can still go for a rectangular footing. Now, a trapezoidal footing is resorted to if the space restriction exists near the heavier column. If you take a look at this picture, you can see that there's a heavy column here or at least if you were to go by the schematic, this one looks heavier and there's a space limitation to project this slab into the property line. Let's assume there's a property line here. So in such cases, you would have to go for a trapezoidal footing where the base of this trapezium breadth is increased compared to, I mean, compared to the breadth here. So of course, it will turn out to be a trapezium here. In short, the heavier column will distribute the load to a larger area and the lighter column will distribute the load to a smaller area.
balancing each other in terms of stress load by area. So, uh, so these parameters govern the choice of uh, a rectangular or a trapezoidal footing. 